That you're here, here with me in the night. Can you hear me when I call? Can you feel this aching soul? Just for the night When he saw the rain resting on the coast Then my God passed over us Can you hear the children sing To the mighty King of Kings 
They said, I am covered, I am covered, for oh my God passed over me. I'm alive today, my sins are raised, for the blood has covered me. We prepared to march out of Pharaoh's reach, always dressed in aid and haste. When the hour came, God delivered us, then we were no longer slaves. Can you hear the children sing to the mighty King of Kings? They said, I am covered, I am covered, for my God has over me. I'm alive today, my sins are raised, for the blood has covered. Christ died for the world. He became the Lamb, perfect sacrifice, freeing every boy and girl. Can you hear the nation sing to the mighty King of Kings? They said, I am covered, I am covered, for my God passed over me. I'm alive today. Jesus bled and died for me. I'm alive today, my sins are raised. For the blood has covered me. For the blood has covered me. For the blood has covered me. Show us that in every season, you will fill our emptiness. Glory be to God, the maker. Glory be to God, creator. Take our time, use our treasure. 
The vineyards you plant will bear fruit. The fields will sing out and rejoice with the King. For all that is Good morning, North Langley Church. I'm Caleb, an intern here, and I'm so glad you've joined us, whether online, at our Walnut Grove campus, or Yorkson campus, we are glad you're here. If you're new here, or maybe you've been here for a while, but just want to get more plugged in, I'd encourage you to visit the welcome desk at the back of either of our campuses, talk to someone, fill out a connect form, find ways you can serve, be involved, find community, or if you're online, or want to do this at home, you can go to nlcc.ca slash welcome to learn more. A great way to connect is through joining a life group. These are amazing opportunities to walk through life with people, laugh, have food, engage in conversation, and go deep together. And the way you can join is through Life Together, starting March 29th at the end of this month. It's a great way to meet new people wanting to form a life group together as well. Lastly, today at 3.30 is the Aldergrove Ice Skating event. This is a great opportunity to meet other people interested in calling the Aldergrove campus their home. It'll be fun and awesome and it's free. So make sure you register online today before 3.30. That's all for NLCC News this morning. I hope if you were in person, you really enjoyed the coffee this morning. Have a great week and I will NLCC you later. Hey, good morning. Let's stand up together.
Jesus, we welcome you um, here, God. We are thankful that you are uh, a Father who loves us. We want to offer you our praise this morning, um, no matter how broken it might feel for us, how weak we might feel, God. We recognize that you are a God who is for us, not against us. That you have our best in mind. And so we offer you our worship here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, you can be seated. And uh, welcome here, whether you're here in the room or if you're online, uh, it is good to, uh, it's good to be here uh, together. It's kind of fun that uh, we can see each other's faces, a lot of our faces now, and there's coffee, which is so cool. Uh, I'm Corey, I'm the worship pastor here, uh, and it is really good to, to be together here this morning. Um, we're going to continue um, in our worship here together. Uh, as always, just so you know, there is a prayer team that we have uh, it's an awesome prayer team. Uh, they would love to, to meet with you here in the room. Uh, you can go to the, uh, the back there. There's a prayer room there uh, to pray about anything at all, whether it's something that's, that's huge uh, or whether it's something that's small, something you want to celebrate. Um, someone would love to meet with you. If you're online, you can email prayer at nlcc.ca, and, uh, and someone will get back to you quickly and would be happy to, uh, to chat with you and to pray with you. Um, I was thinking this morning, we're going to start with uh, just a bit of uh, silence here together, a silent reflection um, there's kind of a, a tension that I often feel. I don't know if you're like me, but, you know, I, we're singing a lot of these really beautiful songs together, and we're hearing about God's goodness, and, um, uh, you know, and then, of course, we read the news, and you see what's going on in Ukraine, and this devastation, and I can't imagine, you know, being a family, being a father, being a friend of who's, who's going through all of this devastation, being displaced, and having to up and move, and um, the fear and the tragedy, and you know, it's like these things are kind of intention for us. And here we are, 
you know, kind of, for the most part, kind of rich Christians, rich Canadians, you know, in this little corner of the world in a great room. And um, so I always feel a bit of tension about that because I'm like, man, I wish we could, I wish we could do something. We're going to be keep praying for them, of course. But I think what's been helpful for me is, um, like, the scriptures are full of, of, like, just all sorts of different vibes, right? Different colors, different vibes. We have these prayers of lament, right, where people, like, where the psalmist is crying out, David or others are crying out, saying, like, God, like, like, where are you? Like, why are you sleeping? Like, why are you, like, w- help me, you know? But then you have other, other passages where there's just this beautiful, triumphant, like, victorious declaration, you know, God, you are good, and, like, your love endures forever, and, like, you, you've blessed me richly, you know? And so there's, there's kind of, like, I think for me, it's, it's important to realize and to remember that, like, a lot of things can be true at the same time. You know, we don't want to abandon one for the other necessarily. And, and so for me, it helps me sometimes when, you know, when we're like, we're going to sing some great songs together, songs of praise that are absolutely true. And then at the same time, recognize like, man, Lord, please like do something for our brothers and sisters that are suffering. Like, how can we be involved? How can we help? And I just was passed on this, um, this Psalm 126. And I just thought I'd read the last couple of verses from it. It's, um, it's just a great, hopefully a prophetic word um, for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and also for Maybe for us, maybe for you and your family, whatever you're going through. Uh, Those who plant in tears uh, will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. It's just this, uh, it's a hopeful, it's a hopeful word from from the Psalms. Okay, so we're going to, um, let's take a bit of quiet here together. Um, We'll just be playing kind of quietly there, but um, just maybe it's a great time for us to, again, to bring these things before the Lord, uh, to center our hearts on him, to ask him to come and meet with us wherever we're at. I don't know what your week has been like or your morning has been like, but God is here. He wants to speak to us. He wants to remind us who we are, who he is. And so we'll do that, and then we're going to uh, we're gonna pray together, and we'll continue uh, singing. So let's just take a minute or so. Let's stand together and pray this uh, together. We praise you for creating this world in all beauty, for redeeming the world through Christ our Lord and sending us the gift of your spirit to encourage, instruct, and sustain us. We long for your spirit to work among us now, to inspire our praise, to challenge us with your truth, and to equip us for service in your world. Amen. If I go up to the 
Come lay them down 
cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Amen. You can be seated. You guys are all the people who wanted to sleep in in the morning. Um, I hope you're doing well. Uh, welcome to church. Welcome to Jesus. For those of you who are new to Jesus, I'm glad you're here. And uh, today, um, if we haven't met, my name's Matthew, but today we have a very, um, a very challenging moment with Jesus. And so I just want to prepare you for that. You can grab your Bibles, Luke 9. Um, and, but before we dive into this really challenging moment with Jesus, um, I, I, I thought of an illustration, um, I thought of a moment in history that really uh, helps me understand Jesus' words. And so in 1933, there was a group um, of, of, of uh, pro-Nazi uh, German uh, churches that decided to become a group, and uh, they actually had a flag uh, to symbolize uh, their group, and uh, there should be a slide uh, with, the f with the flag on the screen. Um, and it's an image of a cross with a swastika right in the middle of it. This is 1933. And these German Christians uh, believed that they could assemble around and support uh, Hitler and the Nazis because, because somehow the Nazi party had something that was going to contribute to the way of Jesus, I guess, <laughs> right? I mean, this is, they were, they saw in a political leader like Adolf Hitler, someone that they could rally behind that would help Germany uh, become more Christian or something like that. That was their line of thought. At the same time, uh, oh, and by the way, they, they called themselves, quote, stormtroopers of Jesus Christ. Another group um, that would be swinging the far other end of the pendulum <laughs> was a group that you've heard about before. I think many of you have heard about. Um, they were called the Confessing Church of Germany. And so names like Karl Barth, Martin Niemöller, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, these are pastors that they assembled uh, and were appalled by this first group that aligned itself with Hitler. And so they, they rejected the Nazi party. They rejected any kind of alliance that Christians would have with political powers. And they wrote the Barman Declaration, 1934. Some of you have read the Barman Decla Declaration. It's quite eye-opening, but I just want to give you um, a little follow, just one line from the Declaration. They write this, we reject the false doctrine as though there were areas of our life in which we would not belong to Jesus Christ, but to other lords. So there's they reject the teaching that says that, you know what, for a lot of my life, I'll follow Jesus. He'll be king. He'll be Lord. But then there's going to be a portion of my life where I'll bow to somebody else. You know, I'll, I'll follow their way. And they reject that. See, Jesus was Lord to the confessing church. Hitler was not. This past week in Russia, uh, hundreds of uh, Russian pastors signed a letter condemning their own government. Uh, for the atrocities being committed. They, they wrote, quote, we call on the authorities of our country to stop this senseless bloodshed. These Russian pastors know that they, they're going to bow a knee to Jesus alone, not to the Russian state. And you know, these kind of moves by these uh, churches that have to make it very clear <laughs> that they're not bowing a knee to the empires of the day, uh, they get their cue from early Christians. Early Christians faced the same situation. They, they were called to go to a market. If you wanted to do business, you, you would go to the marketplace and there would be an altar to Caesar, the worship of Caesar, Caesar Augustus. And what you had to say was, you had to say Kaiser Kurios, right? This is Caesar is Lord. And you would have to take a pinch of incense and put it on the altar. And, and then you were allowed to 
to do commerce, to, to own a business or to buy and sell or whatever it was, to go into the market. And so there was this cult of the emperor that was happening at the time. And, and, and what did the early church confess? The early church confessed Jesus is Lord. I mean, Jesus is Lord is something just so normal to us. We just say Jesus is Lord, you know. But it's political. It, it's dangerous to say that. Because what you're implying is that there are other lords who are not Lord and who have no power over you. Jesus is Lord. And see, it cost the early church dearly to say that. Today, we're going to hear Jesus say and encourage his disciples that they would know that they have one king. One king. That they're part of one kingdom. And to follow Jesus will cost them their lives. Or as Bonhoeffer wrote it, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. So Jesus, these words that you spoke 2,000 years ago to your followers are heavy. And we have forgotten how heavy they are, how important they are, the weight that they carry. And so today we pray that in this little corner of the world, 2,000 years after you spoke these words, that you would speak them again in power. Speak them again into my heart into my mind. Convict me. Speak them into the lives of my friends here. Jesus, we, we want to see you. We want to know you. We want to be captured by you. And God, I pray that as the next number of minutes unfold, that you would just give us a distaste for the way of the kingdoms of this world. And give us a longing and a love for the kingdom of God. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so Luke 9, let's read this together. We're going to go verses 18 to 27. Once, when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. What about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. So this is the word of the Lord. I want us to notice three things in this passage. Three things that tie the story together. Messiah, cross, and kingdom of God. Messiah, cross, kingdom of God. Can you, let's do some crowd participation. Can you say those three things? Messiah, cross, kingdom of God. Yes, so good. Messiah cross kingdom. Let's just burn those in our brain here and let's dive in, okay? Three sections. Number one, Messiah. Jesus asks his disciples what the crowd is saying about him, which is funny because Jesus is never really concerned about the crowd, right? Like, uh, he usually says things that kind of make the crowd walk away and he kind of seems okay with it. But he asks, he said, what are the crowds saying? And they say, oh, you know, the disciples answer. And then, but then he says, what, what, are, what do you say? <laughs> Listen to verse 20. He says this. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. Who do you say that I am? This is the question Jesus really cares about. And I think he asks it to each of us. Who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? Am I just a, am I just a good teacher? <laughs> am I just savior? Am I king? What, who am I? God's Messiah, pop quiz, Peter answers really well on the pop quiz. He says, God's Messiah, 
And God's Messiah, he's right, it means anointed one. Anointed one. Because the kings of Israel were anointed by the priests, right? They were anointed to be king over Israel. And so the anointed one means the king, the king of Israel. This is Israel's long-awaited king who had showed up, who was walking the streets. And in, in the New Testament, we find this double image of Jesus. Jesus is savior and king, or in the language of Revelation 4, he is lion and lamb. So he's a lion. That's a kingly image. He's, he's uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's, he's a king. But he's also a lamb, the lamb that was slain. And by his blood, we are forgiven, right? So there's this double image, lion, lamb. And so king and savior, right? But, but here's what I think. I, I, I think that I'm attracted to a savior, but I'm not so sure about a king, right? You know, if God can simply be the one who just kind of washes me clean of sin, good, I'm good. That's all I need. But king? See, the lion part, the king part, uh, I'm not so sure about because it's going to demand obedience. He, he's going to have authority over my life, and it's going to cost me something. I'm going to actually, I'm going to have to actually live under his rule. See, that's, that's, that's different, isn't it? And the New Testament won't, won't let us uh, walk away from either image. He's the lion and the lamb. They go together. Savior King. Note, when Jesus tell, no, Jesus, uh, when Peter says this, Jesus tells them not to say this to anybody. Did you notice that? Why? Why would he tell them to keep it secret? So verse 22. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Here's why they need to keep his identity secret for a while. Because he's the king and he's going to be killed. See, saying you're a king, see, for us, again, it is so normal for us to talk about Jesus as a king and to talk about a kingdom. I mean, but go back 2,000 years, and someone's walking around saying they're a king. Well, those roles are already taken. Like Caesar Augustus in Rome, taken. G Governor Pilate, Pont Pontius Pilate, he is the puppet uh, ruler of Judea, and Herod, uh, Herod Antipas in Galilee is the Tetrarch of Galilee, these roles are already filled. So when you walk around calling yourself a king, it's political. It's, it's revolutionary. We have to forget our concept of what we think king means today and just go back 2,000 years. This would have been uh, something that would have cost you your life. I mean, just today, today. And this isn't even as crazy today, but let's say you were to walk around calling yourself the prime minister, right? Well, we would all think you were crazy, which some people thought Jesus was crazy, right? But then we would think you were a bit of a threat. Like, what are you doing? You know, and uh, whoever it is, the RCMP or CSIS or wh whatever it is, would start kind of maybe monitoring you a little bit, right? Like, who's this person, right? And they think they're the prime minister, and they're kind of gathering people together, and, and uh, it doesn't look great, right? It's, 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 it's revolution here, right? So kingly language is a threat. But see, Jesus is also a threat to the religious establishment. So he's a threat to the political establishment. He's also a threat to the religious establishment, because they love the power that they have in the temple and with the law. And he says the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, they're in charge, right? But Jesus, nobody, nobody saw this until, until those who were able to start following him, they would, just start, they would start noticing that here is the true elder of the people. In Jesus, here is the true high priest of the people. In Jesus, this is the true teacher of the Torah here. And he is a threat to the religious establishment. He's both king and high priest, and no one in leadership likes him because of that, right? Why? Because Jesus is walking around going, saying things like, your sins are forgiven. Whoa, listen, we only do that in the temple, right? Who are you walking around just declaring that wherever you go? You know? There's a job threat there, like to the, to the priests. And so he says the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected, and he'll be killed. See, Jesus knows where he's going. He's going to the cross. He knows that. He's going to be killed. And then he also predicts his own resurrection. Do you see that? But the Son of Man will come back to life. Jesus is predicting Easter morning. He knows that the Father is going to vindicate. He's going to defeat death itself. 
But do you see why the disciples need to keep this a secret? Jesus knows he'll be killed, but he has a plan for how and when. His death is a well-orchestrated sacrifice that he's going to make in love for the world. But he's in charge. He's got his timing. If you think in any way that Good Friday, that the cross, which we were going to celebrate in a number of days, is somehow this accident, this tragic accident, the sequence of events that went poorly for Jesus, you've got it all wrong. It is a well-orchestrated piece of art where he lays his life down for the world and the things that happen even on that final day is there's fulfillment of prophecy there is just crazy things going on and jesus knows exactly how he how he's going to do it and so he's telling his disciples hey just keep that king thing a little quiet for now right i'm working on a plan here right uh and uh and he and he and he he he's faithful to his plan And we'll celebrate that at Good Friday. So first of all, that's Messiah. See, we're just on point number one, Messiah, boom. Number two, cross, cross. Do you see the cross here? Uh, Jesus challenges uh, his followers to carry the cross. Verse 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Again, crosses are so normal to us, like Put it around your neck. Tattoo it on your arm. People put them on a wall. Put, put the cross on your wall. You put it on a bumper sticker on the back of your car. Like, again, like these, this is a form of torture and execution. It's so normal to us today, right? Crosses are for criminals. Criminals of the empire. That's what they're for. When you go against the way of the empire, a cross is for you. A cross is there for you. It's an image. And so actually the image here is of carrying a cross beam. It would be a cross beam across your shoulder. So it's called a patibulum. Um, And so what would happen is the um, Roman Empire would have like stakes in the ground, right? Uh, Lining a road or up on a hill uh, in plain sight for everyone to see. And these crucifixions would take place. But what the person who was crucified would do, they'd carry it on their back, this one kind of beam, the patibulum, and then they would be placed on the cross, right? Can you imagine raising children during these days, right? Covering the eyes of your children so that they don't see, you know, these naked criminals hung on crosses? The Romans put them right in front of you. They didn't hide this. This was a daily reminder of the empire that was in charge. And so Jesus says, pick up one of those and then follow me. Craig Keener, an amazing biblical scholar, he writes the following. He says, to take the cross was to carry the horizontal beam, the patibulum of the cross out to the site of execution, usually past a jeering mob. In rhetorically strong terms, Jesus describes what all true disciples must be ready for. If they follow him, they must be ready to face literal scorn on the road to eventual martyrdom, for they must follow to the cross. From the moment of faith, believers must count their lives forfeit for the kingdom. What an invitation, right? What an invitation. Did you read this in the terms and conditions when you first became a Christian, right? It was there. And some of us have become Christians, but the people that loved us when they told us about it didn't tell us about this part, right? But Jesus, when he calls people to follow him, he says, I want you to literally count the cost. It will require a death to the old way. It will require a death to the kingdoms of this world. There's a way in which the world is working, and you're going to have to die to that. Now, notice that he says to bear the cross daily. Well, we're not martyred daily, so, so what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, he continues, verse 24 and 25. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? He's saying, here's the deal. If you hang on to the way of the world, see, the world is operating in a certain way. The kingdoms of this world are operating operating a certain way. And if you just hold on and you... You hold on to your life, you, you're going to lose it, actually. But if you surrender and you let go, you, you're somehow going to find life. 
And I think that's why each of us are here today, right? We're here to find life in Jesus. And so he's showing us how to do it. He's saying, if you want life, this is what you're going to do. You're going to have to die to the old order, to the way of the old, the old way. And you're going to literally have to be born again into a new kingdom. It's repenting. It's turning from an old way and living under the kingship of Jesus. And, and if you do this, you're going to find life life. Uh, there's a, a pretty intense moment. Uh, Tanya's grandfather was a German soldier uh, in, in World War II, and he was fighting in France. And uh, my grandfather was an American soldier uh, fighting in France, and they were shooting each other. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I, I'm so glad they missed or whatever, right? Because like their grandchildren got married, right? It's, it's, it's Pretty weird. Uh, but he's a lovely guy. So this is Tanya's dad's dad. And um, his name is Eric Steinhilber. I uh, love that name. And uh, he's such a tender guy, such, a, such an amazing man. And I got to meet him a few times before he passed a number of years ago. And, but he told the family the story of how he was captured in France. It was a moment of surrender. And it, he had shrapnel in his leg. And this French family... I guess, brought him into the house, and he was being cared for. And um, uh, these allied soldiers were patrolling, and they came by this French home and realized that this French family had a German soldier <laughs> in their house. And they're like, okay, buddy, you're coming with us. And, uh, and, but, he, they, but, but he said, they said these words to him. They said, for you, the war is over. For you, the war is over. And uh, Tanya's grandpa said they were the best words I had ever heard. <laughs> They were words of freedom. For you, the war is over. And so get this. The Allied soldiers take him, and he was sent to England, where he got, where he got his, his leg treated. And then he's sent to Colorado to a prisoner of war camp. Tanya's grandpa spent a lot of time in Colorado at a prisoner of war camp, and he said it was amazing. He said, they treated us like kings. Like, we got like three meals a day. We were playing sports. There was all the, they had Mennonite missionaries that spoke German that came to lead Bible studies. He was like, it was unreal. He's like, these enemies of mine are really nice people, right? <laughs> and so much so that he wanted to move his family. So this, uh, Tanya's dad was just a, a young boy at the time. He wanted to move the family to the United States. And uh, they weren't accepting uh, German, former German soldiers at the time, but, so, uh, but Canada was. Woo! And, uh, Canada, and so he moved his family, and, and they ended up in Alberta, which, to be honest, looks a lot like Colorado. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the, the Rocky Mountains on the west and the flatlands on the east. I mean, he got his Colorado. It was just Alberta. And, um, but here's the deal. When he surrendered, it led to life. You know what I mean? Every time you go into the waters of baptism, right, for all of us as Christians, when we went into those waters of baptism, for you, the war is over. You're done. It's surrender. And when we go, oh, I don't know what this means. I'm captured. Absolutely. You've been captured by Jesus. <laughs> You've been captured. And, uh, and it turns out when we're his prisoner, we find life, right? We actually live. We actually get a second chance at life. You know, so this is what Jesus is saying. When you hold on, it's not going to go well for you. But when you let go and surrender, there's life. But it'll cost us everything. Luke 9, 26. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. These words are hard to read. I have a temptation to water them down or to try to over-explain them, but I'm not going to do that. Just let them just kind of hang there, right? Am I ashamed of Jesus? Am I ashamed of his teachings? I want to live under his kingship, but occasionally it's just, it's just, it doesn't really work with the real world, Jesus. It's, I'm not really sure I love all of your teachings. Following Jesus may feel like you're going against the flow of the world around you. And we're going to be tempted to feel ashamed, embarrassed, fearful. 
Am I ashamed of the king and his kingdom? By the way, I hope at no point this morning do we over-rotate on this and go, well, I'm not ashamed, and I'm going to go tell the world exactly what's up. It's like, okay, calm down, buddy. That's not what this is saying here, right? It's not a license to be a Christian jerk, right? This is, this is him asking us the true state of our heart. Are we ashamed? So summary so far, Messiah, he's the king. Cross, he's calling us to take up a cross daily and follow him. And the third thing, kingdom kingdom of God. Let's look at this. Last verse. Verse 27, truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. What an interesting phrase. What is the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God is the space, place, and people where God is king. Did I clear it up for you? <laughs> uh, the places and people where God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. See, in heaven, God's will is being done, but it's on earth, it's those people that you encounter who worship Jesus as king and who have aligned their lives under his kingship. See, you can't see the kingdom. There's not like geographical boundaries. There's not like one language or one ethnicity. No, it's people from all over the world speaking all kinds of languages. There's no boundaries, right? It's a... But all of them say, we want the reign of God to happen in our life. Right? That's the kingdom of God. A people marked by following the way of Jesus. To his disciples, he says, some of you will see the kingdom of God. Well, what's that about? Well, 11 of the 12 would see the kingdom of God. One, unfortunately, would not. And that's Judas. Judas. Judas died before he was able to see a few things. He died before he was able to see the true king coronated on the cross. When Jesus wears the crown of thorns, it's his coronation day. King of kings. Judas was unable to see Jesus, the true king, alive and conquering death itself. Vindicated fully. The king is alive. Judas was unable to see Jesus ascending to the right hand of the Father. See, the ascension, we don't know what to do with that, but you need to know that's a kingly moment. Jesus ascends, and what does he sit? He sits at the right hand of God, reigning on his throne. He's king of kings. He's Lord of lords, and he has a kingdom, right? And Judas missed out on the coming of the Holy Spirit, the moment when God fills his people with his power and his glory and his grace, and his love, and his presence. And the king says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be in you. I'm going to give you so much of God's love, and grace, and power. The kingdom of God. And there began the kingdom of God, where Jesus is king. But being part of that kingdom will clash against the kingdoms of the world. It'll happen. It's like tectonic plates, right? When they when they hit each other, we get earthquakes. And that's what's going to happen is the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of the world, whenever they, there's friction right there, right? So Messiah, cross, kingdom of God. See, we're part of a different way of living. We are under new management. We are citizens of a new country. Our allegiance is to him alone. And I just need to make a really quick note. Whenever you hear Jesus talk, I should have said this earlier, but whenever you hear Jesus talk about carrying your cross, this is not about self-hatred. You need to know that. This is not about self-condemnation, thinking poorly of yourself, you know? It's not what this is about. Do you now see what it's about? You are loved. Jesus loves you. You are made in the image of God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Like, the king loves you a lot, Right? Carrying your cross is simply being willing to follow the one who loves you deeply and being willing to pay the price for whatever that means, right? Listen again to the Barman Declaration. We reject the false doctrine as though there were areas of our life in which we would not belong to Jesus Christ, but to other lords. So I want to get practical. What does this look like for you and I in the final few minutes we have here to to, to carry our cross daily. I'm going to ask right now, could you, only if you desire, bring your life to mind, all the things you're walking through, dealing with, and I'm going to go through about like six examples really quickly. One of these might mean something to you. Uh, two of them might mean something to you, right? I hope at least one will mean something to you. But 
I want, to just, I want us to hear the way of the king, okay? The way of the kingdom of God. And for us to look at our lives and to go, are we walking in line with the king? So, sometimes in big ways, other times in subtle ways, time and time again, we are going to be tempted to, to, to swim with the tide, right? To go with the tide of, of the kingdoms of the world. And so I want us to hear the Sermon on the Mount. Most of these are from the Sermon on the Mount. A couple aren't. But uh, let's listen to Jesus. So example number one, this might be something you're going with or dealing with. First of all, it's easy to hate our political enemy. This is to go with the flow of the world. To, to hate your political enemy, it's easy. Right? Some of you just want to amen that deep down. You know, you don't have to do it out loud, but just you're like, yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about, right? Yeah, to go with the flow. But following Jesus, we can't go there. That is life under a different ruler. It's just simply life under a different kingdom. It doesn't mean I will always, please hear me clearly. It, this never means that we are supposed to support everything our political, quote unquote, enemy is saying. Think of early Christians. Do you think they loved everything Caesar, the Caesars were doing in Rome? Absolutely not. No, right? But I'm saddened at how quickly Christians can speak with such hatred towards our political leaders. If I, it, of any stripe, please, like this is, this is not about one leader, okay? Just any leader at any time, go back decades, you know, just think about how we have responded to leaders. If I follow Jesus, I can't go there. Why? Because he literally told, he He's the king. He's not giving advice. He's not out there just going, hey, this was some great advice. I mean, it'd be really a little bit better if you tried this. He's like, this is what I'm saying to you. At Matthew 5, you have heard it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. I tell you, command here, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It's your king. It's not a suggestion. Second example, I think it's very easy to adopt how the world understands sex and gender, and it's very easy for me uh, to be tempted to go with the flow of the kingdoms of this world. I, just so you know, totally understand, there are many in the room who are still processing some of this, Two years ago, we did an eight-week series called Loved, and it was a challenge. And I know some of you are like, maybe not wanting to be at North Langley if this is the way we understand sex and gender. I get that. And you're still processing, and it's difficult, but you're committed to following Jesus, which I love. I love that. But as we carry our cross and follow Jesus, we just cannot adopt the uh, often changing ways in which the world views our sexuality and gender. So when we follow Jesus and have the patibulum on our back, we hear these words, Matthew 19. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Are we willing to hear that and to say, oh, as I begin to follow Jesus and I struggle with that, is he giving me the blueprint for what marriage looks like in the kingdom of God? Am I ashamed of that? Am I embarrassed by that? Third, it's easy to love money and a certain lifestyle and to store up treasure for ourselves. That one, you're welcome to amen out loud if you would like to. Any takers? None. Okay. <laughs> this is to go with the flow of the world. It's so easy, is it not? I mean, I'm preaching this to myself here. We assume a certain lifestyle, but it keeps us from having margin to be able to bless others. I mean, at a time of rising gas prices, of inflation, of cost of homes surging, I mean, shouldn't we, the church, followers of Jesus, be the ones that have extra change in our pockets, extra money in the bank to be able to give, to bless, to care for others in a time of need? 
that this would not be the time of pulling back and building bigger barns and storing for ourselves, and, but it's actually a, mo- a moment to be generous, to give away. But, but we don't have any more margin to bless because we've been operating in the kingdom of the world. We haven't come under the kingship of Jesus. Jesus, who ta- tells us to be rich towards God, um, and, and, and here's his wisdom. Matthew 5, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is there any way in which this feels like a suggestion to you? Like, um, oh, that's that's nice. He's offering some financial advice. Thank you, you know. I'll take it or leave it. Not so sure, right? But he's, he's literally saying, like, where you take your money, your actual money, your treasure, where you place it, your heart will follow. Like, your heart's going to go there. So the king in the kingdom is asking us to ask that question. Where's your treasure? You'll know where your treasure is by where you get ang- your anxiety levels, right? Anxiety levels, fear right? Do I have enough? I need to earn more. I need to save more. I need to hoard, hoarding, you know, at a time where he's asking us to bless. So just offering suggestions. What does it mean to carry your cross daily? What does it mean to live in the kingdom of God? Fourth example, it's easy to bend the truth. See, to go with the flow of the world is to is to have the kind of speech filled with half-truths. It's to be loose with our words. It's to say yes when we mean no. It's to bend the truth. It's, it's, it's to practice maybe even a, just a subtle version of manipulation. Right? Kind of manipulating and just bending the truth. That's, that, that, that's life under a different king. It's a different kingdom, Right? We don't operate that way. Like Jesus, when he looked at his followers, he really wanted his followers to be trustworthy. Like when you ran into any of his followers that you'd be like, oh, those are truth people. They're so clear. Like they they don't deceive. They don't manipulate with their words. They, they, They don't have to take an oath to get someone to believe them. Like I don't know if you're in a conversation with someone, but as soon as they have to say, I swear, right? Then you're like, oh, can't trust you, right? Because you're swearing. I don't even know what that means, but... But clearly, like your normal, simple words, I can't trust those anymore, right? I promise, I swear. It's like, ah, actually, that makes me really not trust you, right? When you say it like that. But Jesus wanted his followers to hear this. Matthew 22, 37. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Anything beyond that, you're you're starting to manipulate. You're, you're, you're using words as a power game to try to get what you want. Just be yes or no people. Fifth, it's so easy to go with the way and the kingdom of the world when it comes to lust. Man, to follow lust is just to follow, it's just to slowly go downstream to destruction. You know? Oh, I was so great the other day. We, I was able to attend the Freedom Session graduation at our church. So thankful for our leaders at Freedom Session and just watching all of those great grads who just spent 21 weeks following Jesus, being filled with the Spirit, bringing their life into the light and finding freedom. It was so cool. And some of them told stories of of addiction, uh, sex addiction, pornography addiction. And there was a sense in which the kingdom of the world was bringing death into their lives. And so I was just so proud of them for just... For, for finding freedom in Christ and the way in which Jesus worked. I literally had tears in my eyes as I watched people set free from the power of lust. But we're, we're <laughs> I think a lot of us use this little lie in our heart. Like we say kind of, quote, no one can control the lust of the heart, right? There's no way. Everybody does it, right? 
and it justifies our behavior. Or, quote, everyone watches shows with sex and nudity, and it's normal. Like, is it normal? Like, here's the deal. I grew up in the church in the 80s and 90s that was very legalistic, right? Things that you could watch, not watch, and there was this legalism. And a lot of us kind of were like, this is ridiculous. Like, what about good art? And we kind of moved that direction, right? Which, which I get, and I understood that. And there was kind of a weird pharisaicalism, if you say it that way. Uh, to, to some of the way in which the church talked about things. But when I think about the quote-unquote freedoms now to watch anything, I mean, is, any, is it all good? Is this all helping you follow Jesus? Is this good for purity of mind? And is it helping you love your neighbor and love God in a deeper way? I mean, in what ways have we kind of moved way too far the opposite way? How's the purity of your mind? Because we want to hear Jesus the King say this, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus is serious about your heart. The king loves you and really wants your heart to be in a good place. He cares a lot. Finally, this is the last example. It's so easy to believe that we have a righteous anger. Okay? the flow of the kingdoms of this world, it's super easy to believe that all of the anger I have is righteous. Let me say something really quick. I believe that there is a category called righteous anger. I do think so, right? right? And that anger has a place. There's a, that obviously anger sometimes are emotions that we need to deal with. I get that. Some of you are counselors. No need to email me later. I, I, I understand, <laughs> right? But here, can you just hear the point I want to make here today? What I want to make is that any time I talk to a Christian about anger, they, they tell me, oh, but did you know there's righteous anger, right? And I'm like, oh, really? T- tell me about that. Because the last thousand people I've talked to about anger have not mentioned this thing you call righteous anger. Everyone mentions righteous anger. Everyone thinks, that, well, have you heard Jesus in the temple? Like, Jesus in the temple, he had a whip. I'm like, where's this conversation going? Are you planning on buying a whip? Like, do you, we need, you need some accountability partners here, right? If you, so this is what I want to say back to everyone who, thinks they, they've got the righteous anger clause. It's like, and you're living in that, like I'd say, okay, so are you, are you the son of God? Like completely perfect, sinless? Are you sinless? No? So, and you're able to see so clearly the sins of others that you're able to speak into those sins, right? No, you're not. I'm not either. And so I don't always know how the righteous anger thing works with general anger, whatever. But all of us as Christians, we're quick to believe that we're the ones who have righteous anger, right? We all think that. And uh, to assume our anger is righteous, we condone our anger, we baptize our anger, it's to go with the flow of the world, but to carry our cross, we have to hear the king say this. Like, listen to his words. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. It's not mincing his words. Do we realize that the way of the world is not the way of Jesus? Do we realize that the way of Jesus is going to cost us something? I love this quote from Donald Miller, old book, Blue Like Jazz. He said, the trouble with deep belief is that it costs something. And there's something inside me, some selfish beast of a subtle thing that doesn't like the truth at all because it carries responsibility. And if I actually believe these things, I have to do something about them. It is so, so cumbersome to believe anything, and it isn't cool. (laughs) I love that quote. I like that line. If I actually believe these things, I have to do something about them. And again, remember your baptism. Remember the moment when you died, and you died to the kingdoms of this world. When you came up out of the water, you were born again into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of the Son of God, who loves you and wants to show you how to live. When Christ calls a man, he bids him, come and die. So what I'd love to do is I'd love to ask you to stand. Would you stand? And we're going to have a moment of prayer. And this will be a bit of an extended moment of prayer, but if you would like to, you can hold your hands out, you can close your eyes, just, we're ready to receive from the king. We want to hear his truth in our lives. With your eyes closed, I just want to remind you there was another moment when Jesus taught his disciples to put something else wooden across their shoulders. And he called it a yoke. It's a yoke. And he t- 
It's a farming tool. The animal would wear a yoke and plow the field. And he told them, he said, that his yoke was easy and his burden was light. And Jesus is promising us as we wear the yoke that there's rest for our souls. Jesus, you, you wore the easy and light yoke of your heavenly Father. What your Father asked you to do, the way your Father asked you to to live, you followed in obedience and it was easy and it was light, the yoke you wore. And you told us we could wear that too and that we would find rest and that we would find joy and that we'd find intimacy with you, God. And so, Lord, as we think about carrying our cross, we're also well aware that we carry your yoke. And I pray that you would just show us the way in which we're following the way of the world. Lord, as you begin to reveal a few things in our hearts and mind, remind us that the way of the kingdom of God, the way of our King, is better because it's so hard to be bitter Jesus it's so hard to manage relationships based on lust and greed it's so hard to just be consumed by consumerism to be angry all the time to be envious of someone's life Lord it's so hard it's so burdensome we don't want it anymore we're just done and so we pray that you would show us how to open up our hands and surrender and to hear once again that for us the war is over it's done that that we surrender we give up our life in order to find life in you jesus so what are you saying to us north langley i think he comes to you right now and he says who do you say that i am will you trust me I picture his arms extended to you. Maybe you can see that in your mind's eye, just with your eyes closed. Just maybe his arms are outstretched towards you and just saying, come, follow me. I want to rescue you out of the kingdom of the world and come into my kingdom. Anytime in the next number of minutes, our prayer team is here. They're ready to pray with you. They really want to come alongside you. So if any of these things from the Sermon on the Mount kind of prompted something in you, they would just love to pray with you. They would love to encourage you, to pray for freedom, for hope. And here as we close, Jesus, we see your arms, your arms open wide for us, but we see them extended on a patibulum, on a cross, because you carried the cross and you gave up your life for us. You were never uh, teaching something that you weren't willing to live out yourself. And we see the way in which you died for us and paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. And we love you. And we give our lives to you. Would you come and reign and move? Amen.
from his head.
face to shine upon you. God bless you as you go out into the world and be his hands and feet. We will see you next Sunday. Thank you.